Let's start a game like that. Okay. Yeah. Hello, my name is Lisa Bowerman, and I'm an actress and a director uh, for Big Finish, amongst others. Hello, I'm Tanya Rodriguez, and I'm an actor and a voice artist. When was the first time we very first met? Because it wasn't through acting, was it? No, in fact, it was through photography. Photography. Because you are a fantastic headshot <laughs> photographer. Like most actors, however successful you are, in order just to keep you know, the wolf in the door, you have to diversify. And yeah. um, I started taking photographs at drama school. And you, I yeah. think, one of my, obviously, one of my early clients. But actually, funnily enough, when you took my photo, you said to me then, do you know about this company called Big Finish? And they do these amazing audio dramas. I was and... plugging their wares <laughs> even then. I'm still waiting for the commission. It's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, in, I mean, in terms of... of you starting off in, in the industry, I mean, mm. I'm assuming you went to drama school. Well, actually, yes, but I got the bug much, much before then. So even when I was, I don't know, 10 and 11, I well, first I wanted to act, desperately, yeah. desperately wanted to act. And it, and it is that need for it. I know people, yeah. know, it sounds a bit stereotypical, but the, uh, I remember the principal of the drama school, I was at uh, Bristol Old Vic, he said either you want to be a, a normal person or you want to be an actor. Yes. I mean, you, you, you really have to want to do it because it is a pretty bonkers industry to go into, isn't it? Really? Yeah, everything, everything we've talked about so far is just bringing to my mind one of the questions that we were going to talk about today, which is what advice would you give an actor uh, or someone who wants to go into yeah. acting? And I think it is the combination of... You really, really need to want to yeah, do it. It is. It's, it's a so sort of an obsession. Waiting isn't it? Yeah. around it and is. not doing it. And it, then the other thing, you know, with your photography is about having something else that sustains you and yeah. that's something else that can keep you, you going. You, ha you have to be prepared to diversify. I mean, yeah. in, in the industry now, I mean, people always talk about actors as if they, all they ever do is acting. But most of us have done every job in the world. I yeah. mean, at my agreement, with my parents before I went to drama school was to do a secretarial course for a year. Mm -hmm. And I've worked in every office known to man. Me I've too. I've shorthand and typing, <laughs> you know, and you do the, you, you do all of that. And then, you know, you do the front of house and you do the reception yeah. And, yeah. and you waitress and you, yeah. and I went to Gatwick Airport and a cafe on the till, you know, I mean, <laughs> you, you do those jobs. And yeah. actually, I think those little jobs that sometimes have nothing to do with acting are as useful Definitely. As, as, as anything else. Yeah. But I think what's really good about uh, all the other jobs that you do uh, is that it just it's just real life. Exactly. And if you're yeah. going to be an actor, you have to reflect real life. Absolutely. So you can only reflect real life if you're in real yes. life. Yes, and you meeting. Know, and meeting. meeting lots of different yeah. people. Absolutely. And, um, you know, that's, that's and, and key. And we all, so. I mean, it, it, sounds, it, sounds, it sounds a bit stereotypical, but there's always that element of meeting people. You're thinking, I'll use you. <laughs> um, I mean that sounds a bit, you know, yeah, exactly. Sorry. But you do hook onto little traits. Um, Tanya, I'm going to ask you about your first big finish experience and were there any standout moments for you for big finish? <laughs> so my first big finish experience was in a an episode called Scavenger, and I was a princess in India in the 1600s, and that princess had been absorbed by a spaceship that was getting around and and just your average yeah, sort of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then I became part of the spaceship that was then going around this killing sounds, people sounds very stereotypical what was your approach to that <laughs> <laughs> or did you just have fun um it was a it was actually sort of a love story in a way because the the other character Salim had been for hundreds of years, stayed alive and was looking for my character, who who he had seen, you know, snatched away from him by this, and mm. he stayed alive trying to search for this ship, and the it was a story about them being reunited, and oh. and my I was staying alive because I wanted to see him again, and oh, yeah, so it was so it was. Had you done sci any science fiction before? Had you? That was that your first foray? Uh, yeah, I think 
it was my first foray, and I was so excited because I love science fiction. Oh, right. see, this is it. Yeah, People I kind do. of assume that I'm a Doctor Who, uh, uh, the, well, Doctor Who, you don't like yeah, science fiction. fiction. <laughs> and I've always said my line has always been I'm a fan of good drama, and frankly, I am a it fan doesn't of good drama, matter what genre it is. And yeah. science fiction, if it's well written, can cross it, it, it's so allegorical because you can actually deal with any subject within the science fiction genre. And I've played a lot of captains and lieutenants yeah, who are yeah. really hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, looking at me physically, I don't, don't get cast <laughs> as like a top, you know. No, I do suits really very well. Really fit, uh, sort of military person, yeah, but yeah. audio I can do. Yeah, well, exactly. It's exactly. great. But, but I've done a fantastic pirate queen you. With did. You did. And a girl which pirate was queen so much like fun. Seven. So but of course, fun. we were recording that in lockdown. Yeah. So um, it, it's very strange because although we've worked together a couple of times, yeah. we haven't done it face to face. I know. It's so lovely to see you I in real know. life. <laughs> I find that I get a lot more work, I mean, regardless of Big Finish, with people mentioning somebody else to somebody else to, so, you know, that, that, mm. that, that weird, um, gl I would say glass ceiling, it's almost a cement ceiling with, with, with casting directors and things like television or, mm. or even theatre these days. It's very difficult to get through to anything more substantial, whereas in audio, I feel there's a lot more um, movement amongst the kind of work that we can do purely through people recommending. You know? Yeah, and also because it's not based anything on what you look like. So no, exactly. for me, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a huge thing. I was going to say, what, at, um, it's a question I wanted to ask. At drama school, did they make a judgment about what you would face when you left at college? No. I think when I first got out in, into and started working in the late 80s, early 90s, the castings I had were actually very adventurous and... Good. Um, it wasn't dictated to by the opinions that people had about... No, I mean, your... one, of, we, one of my favourite pro projects I was involved in, obviously, was, was um, a film called Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. The BBC Two one. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I played Katie, who was um, the Fantastic. Charlotte Coleman character slash Jeanette Winterson character's lover oh yes and that was incredibly um I mean, it's so high profile as well yeah it, well it was an amazing cast to work it was, with I it remember was it well. fantastic script and yeah. you know i was just so so lucky fantastic. but it was also not the stereotypical casting good it was you know yeah to play a young lesbian woman who yeah. was completely comfortable with her sexuality and who was very happy about it all yeah in 1989 yes exactly exactly <laughs> yeah um were and, 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 as well you know yeah and to be and to look like i look yes um that was quite broad-minded and i think that it's really important that there are more people of color seen in all sorts of um roles that are positive basically. yes exactly not that, being a, and, yeah and inspirational yeah yeah and it's great and equally you know for all the just a broader diversity of people yeah. being seen in in positive ways yeah. is really really important so what was but your first audio gig what was your first i wanted to ask you yeah, something yeah, yeah. because i've been thinking about it a lot what is it like having played a character for 25 years <laughs> I still can't believe I'm still doing That's it. That's amazing. It's I insane, mean, insane, isn't it? I do you just... feel? What do you? How? How is it like to grow it, with it, a character like that? Well, I think the quality of the character has to be there in the first place, and it was created by Paul Cornell as as a, a, a companion for the Seventh Doctor in all the novels, the New Adventure novels, which were a little bit more adult in tone than than a lot of the stuff that had gone before. Anyway, um, and I read this insane audio called um, uh, Oh No It Isn't, which is based around Panto. Yes, I listened to it. it. I did, it's great. It's the most insane I loved it. thing ever. But also, I was used to very old-fashioned radio drama with Bring Your Hard Bottom Boots and, you know, yeah. and, and, and doing all the radio technique. But there was literally just one microphone yeah. in, in a in a cellar in Elephant and Castle and all these actors including Nick Courtney used to play the Brigadier and, and Mark Gatiss before he was Mark Gatiss you know yeah. and I remember getting the, the, the tape in those days back yeah. and it also came out on CD cutting edge you know? <laughs> and, um, and I was expecting it to say, and, and suddenly this soundscape came and I thought that's extraordinary yeah. and over the years it's had story arcs it's had single 
um, CDs. And then in the last few years, uh, they put me back with the doctor, although it's a Bernie Summerfield series. Yeah. Uh, they put me with Sylvester McCoy for two box sets. Yeah. And then with David Warner, who yeah. played this wonderful alternate doctor. Uh, again, all the producers, they haven't kept the character static. Mm. She actually has this huge backstory. I mean, there's all sorts of you know yeah. webs, but every one of them has hasn't thrown the baby out with the bathwater, yeah. but managed to keep her interesting enough for people to stay with her mm. because that's the strength of the character. And like any actor, all we want is to look on a page and go, I get this person and yeah. I understand and I yeah. see where they're coming from. Yeah. And I suppose after all this time, there's a rhythm to her and, and yeah. she's a real person. And I think yeah. because of her fallibility, I think that's the reason for her longevity is that she's, she's not a superhero. She's not um, you know, in, in, in purpose to everything. She, she, she responds in a very human way to everything. Mm. And it doesn't get out by doing, you know, flying kicks or magic. She, mm. she uses a bit of that. I mean, I, I, I feel I've been very lucky both as actor and director with some of the scripts. I mean, my, my, I mean obviously I love Bernie Summerfield. Of course I do, because I love acting. But of all the series that I've worked on, there was a series called Jago and Lightfoot. Yeah, which are based off two characters who were on, on telly in the 70s in, mm -hmm. in the talons of Wang Chai and uh, set in Victorian London and we did sort of 13 and a half series of them with two wonderful actors Chris Benjamin and, and Trevor Baxter and I when we did the very first episode, it was done as a companion chronicle, which are these little two-handed plays that they were doing for quite a while with you know previous characters or yeah. mainly companions of the Doctor. And uh, we got them in. They hadn't seen each other for 25 years. And it was like theatrical gold. And David Richardson, uh, Richardson who'd suggested this in the first place, said there's, there's some future in this. So we managed <laughs> to get a, um, a full series going. And I'd happened to fill in a, this character called Ellie, who's a kind of cockney barmaid, just because I was there. And it was a sort of, you know, it was a bit like Cheers. They all discussed things around the bar. And he said, oh, we're keeping Ellie on. I went, oh, don't be ridiculous, you know, so... I did that. I mean, it's talked hard out for about 30 years. It's <laughs> sort of a bit croaky today. But um, I, I had so much fun. I mean, we talk about fun a lot. Yes. And I know it's an overused word, but that series was a joy and I miss it like mad. Well, with all that 25 years experience, what, do you, what would you say is the difference between audio and other genres in terms well, of acting? Well, you must have experienced it as well, though. I mean, I... I, I think pretty much very little, actually. Same here. <laughs> Absolutely. The bottom line is, can you act? Yeah. I mean, you've got to... You, but you, in you, terms of the performance... Performance, you, you cut your cloth according to your genre. I mean, this is what I, I, I have... This is going to sound so judgmental. I, I have a real problem with drama schools at the moment dividing things into different categories of training. Because an, as an actor, in order to work at all, you have to be able to cross genre all the time. Mm. So people go, oh, no, I'm a film actor. And you go... No, you're an actor who does film, mm -hmm. but that, 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 that sounds rather grand. Oh, I trained in film acting. No, no you, you're an actor. Yeah. And when I'm casting, when I'm doing the director, when I'm casting for audio, you get a lot of kids nowadays who've gone straight into TV thinking that radio is like television because there's a microphone here. Mm. There's nothing like it. Mm. I would say that radio is much more akin to theatre mm. because I'm, I'm sure you've had the same. You need that physical energy, yeah. that vocal yeah. energy yeah. to be able to give it some. Yes. Just because the microphone's there doesn't yeah. mean to say that, you know, you, you need to be able to do that. Yeah, and you're not just acting with your head or your voice even. You are acting with your whole body you and you can hear it. You can hear yeah, it when exactly. people are oh, yeah, connected. Love. Dropping everything, you know. or or just well, just when they're feeling it with their whole body, yeah. or and mm. especially in big finish when you're running I know, and being so chased and being life. yeah, yeah. But you have to, you almost have to give younger younger actors permission to go for that. They feel it's over the top. Mm. Um, <laughs> I first met Matt Smith, who played one of the Doctor Who's when he was straight out of the National Youth Theatre, because Wendy uh, Padbury, who was an agent at, uh, at Evans and Rice. Uh, who was a Doctor Who companion in the 60s, with Patrick Tratton, who's a friend of mine, used to send me people for photographs. And Matt turned up as a, as a very green, very, very little confidence in himself. And I remember Wendy saying, this boy's extraordinary. And he, he was very, very conscious about not having been to drama school. And I remember saying, don't question it. If, if people think you're good and you can do it, don't analyse it. Just 
just do it. Have that confidence. Yeah. I was going to ask you about audio books mm. because, of course, you do an enormous amount of mm. audio books. And you have to. Yes, yeah. but, but but talking in terms of creating different characters within audio books. Yeah, yeah. Do you, you know, what have do fun I do? with them? What, <laughs> do you, what do you do, Tanya? <laughs> tell me, tell me. Um, yeah, well, I think... Um, my process is that I'd, I'll just read the book and get remember how I feel when I'm reading the book because that's what exactly. I also really want to convey yeah. to the to the listener as well that that same sense of thrill or fear or comedy or whatever it is that, that yeah. I'm getting out of that book. And in terms of characters, I'll make a big list of all the characters and I'll mine the text for all the clues in the text. So yeah. everything that yeah. is the author mentions about every character do you find those choosing, are really helpful hints uh, assuming you use an ipad do you, do you find you're choosing the highlighter color depending on what the character is <laughs> yes <laughs> yellow is my main character yes, yes, is, me. is that you yes. yeah <laughs> pink That's is for funny. the slightly girly ones you know? <laughs> but it's a good shorthand it to is, you when you're reading good, yeah when you're actually in the studio mm. reading, mm. that you, mm. if you know what your colours are, it's a crazy yes, thing. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't think people realise quite how much hard work audiobooks are. Yeah. I mean, you've done a, a lot, but physically hard physically, work. Physically, I'm exhausted at yes. the end of the day. It's, it's relentless, isn't it? Can't do anything else no, and definitely no. can't speak. When did you first start doing audiobooks? When did you stumble into audiobooks? Well, if you did stumble into it. Uh, I, I know I walked towards it because... <laughs> I was really interested in, it started out that I was really interested in doing some work for RNIB because oh. I'm, I, I'm really interested in charities that work with blind people, yeah. um, and support blind people. And so I went to, I found out that they did books and so I went along and in those days, or maybe still, you had to audition, oh, wow. had an audition at RNIB and it was lovely, it, was, it was, just went really well and started recording books for them and that was quite a long time ago actually yeah. and uh, lots of pre then other producers used to record at RNIB studios and so I started to meet other well this is what we were talking about earlier is that that, that cross-reference between audio companies will yeah. say oh I heard you do that or, or you're in studio can you we're looking for a spare voice to you know that, yeah. that sort of <laughs> well that's the dream that is the dream isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so Tanya in terms of uh challenges as an actor uh, is there anything else that, that the kinds of characters that you played that you think oh I wish I could have played I, I'd love to do that I don't there's still so many really mm. well, that's the thing with acting you can play yeah. anything from a slug to yeah. a high court judge you know? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to play the doctor I think you'd make I, I a very good doctor actually I think I've spent too long thinking about the answer yes. to that <laughs> <laughs> would you would I I want I want to play Bernie something. <laughs> yeah, you, that. yeah. But the problem quite. is I'm a bit old now, so maybe not. I don't know. Um, my, my problem, it's not a problem, uh, when it comes to television is, uh, and I, I've been quoted on this a few times, is that I, I don't think I've knowingly portrayed a human emotion on television for the last 30 years. Well, not knowingly anyway, because <laughs> I'm normally a walking, talking information machine. I come in as a doctor, or I come in as a lawyer, or I come yeah. in, here's your contract, or what's your pulse? Yeah. But actually having... An opportunity, a story arc, a story arc well, to, developed to, to, play, to play an emotion, yeah. to, pl yeah. to play somebody who's upset or to play yeah. somebody who's traumatised or to play even comedy. I, I, I miss, I would love to do yes, some more comedy, comedy on television. I, I mean, I love the comedy on the audio and I'm very lucky with Benny because there's some very funny stuff. Mm. And, and also even with Jago and Lightfoot. But mm. um, the opportunity to do that in, 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 in front of a camera or on, on stage, I love playing comedy on stage. Mm. Again, there's that... The, it sounds like you're a bit of a control freak, but when you're doing comedy on stage, you know, you've got to be very careful because you know when the, the laughs are coming up. Yeah. But when you hit it right and you get that great woof, there's nothing like it. It gives you a really good kick. You have to play it straight. You can't play it as comedy. Yes. You know? yeah. um, in terms of our agenda and why we're here today talking on International Women's Day, have there been any particular that you've well, had I think one of the with? things that thankfully also seems to be changing uh, is uh, being a mother. Um, and when I, when my children were little, um, well, I mean, it was it was impossible to find the right time in 
in the oh, sure. you know back then yeah. to say okay I'm going to have children, children. Yeah. and then just come out of the business for a while or people try to keep going during it yeah, yeah. however it goes is, as is it your happened I made actor? he's not thankfully oh, I was going to say so, it's good <laughs> so I made the decision that I did want to be with them when I was little and I was mm-hmm. able to take some time out but then getting back in again it was quite interesting I had quite a few people say um you know don't talk about being a mother and I'd be sort of saying <sighs> Well, that's what I've done for the last yeah, four exactly. or five years or whatever. You're absolutely right. And uh, did you find that was coming from casting directors as a matter of interest? From all directions. Okay. Yeah, that makes it sound like I talked about it a lot, which no, I no, didn't. No, but no, if sure. you're coming back into a profession mm, and somebody's so saying, why? what have yeah. you been doing? What yeah, have you been yeah, doing? Yeah. Um, you, I've been doing that. Perfectly it's life. legitimate. It's exactly. Life. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Having a life. It doesn't yeah. affect my ability as an actor no, exactly. or my experiences or what what exactly. I've learned or what I bring to the job now yeah. um yeah. Yeah. and I think that's become it everyone's become much more supportive of that oh, now good. thank yes. goodness yes. and equity yeah. as well yeah. I've been yeah. making sure that yeah. parents Child are care. supported yeah. I mean from my point of view obviously I don't I don't have children I didn't have those same pressures I think the challenge is now it's 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 how you look I mean I've more than once been into castings when I know I'm the only one without the Botox and all of that. And, and those pressures are very different now. And you have to be brave enough to say, who am I competing with? I can't compete with the 30, 40 year olds. That's, that's absurd. But at the same time, you know, nobody likes to watch themselves growing older on camera. Yeah. Which but... is why we stick to radio. <laughs> 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 but, but it's so important to reflect real life. Of course it know. is. And I wish... There was, I mean, it's lovely to see things like Happy Valley and, and all exactly. those fantastic dramas where yeah. women are just doing their thing. The, the current challenge that I think we have is the perception of older women in their 60s and 70s who are still very active. Most yeah. of them are working still, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I hope that, that, that the industry will embrace that a little bit more in the stories they tell. I'm optimistic that it will. Going back to Big Finish... The irony was people say, oh, it's a real old, you know, boys club. But their first project was Bernie Summerfield. It was adapted by Jack Rayner. She's the most fantastic writer and she'd adapted the book. She was great. And it was it was a female driven initial project. And actually, when you look back, well done them. Yeah, you know? absolutely. <laughs> when I was much younger, I think I was drawn to, I mean, being an actor geek, I was always drawn to a good performances whether it be male or female but I remember always loving Catherine Hepburn because she always seemed to have a she she was playing straightforward she was quite androgynous and in fact I was a bit of a tomboy yeah and I always thought you didn't have to play the sort of sexy girly chiffony sort of parts yeah and she uh, and and subsequently knowing more about her life now and how she said no I'm not going to be paid that I'm going to be doing this I'm not going to be signing this contract a bit like Betty Davis yeah. you know we're going back to the 30s and 40s yeah. now but women like that I think were the forerunners of a lot of what's uh, going on and I hope that sort of that that drive doesn't get lost where do you see yourself in 10 years time I hope that I will still be acting ditto <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah